Hey everyone, welcome to News and Brew Sports Viz, our to the point video and podcast series that advocates for the financial voices in college athletics and features new developments impacting the business of college sports. I'm Katie Davis. I'm joined by my partner, Ken Kurtzel, and we are the leaders of the James Moore Collegiate Athletics team. We're certainly happy to have you join us today as Ken and I share a brew while we chat with Mario Mocha. He's the athletics director at uh, New Mexico State University. Welcome, Mario. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, first things first, uh, Ken and I are very interested in hearing about your collection that we've seen uh, you talk about on social media and um, want to hear more about what that is. Sure. Well, you know, when you're in this profession, you have ADs that collect helmets, they collect different things. And, you know, I was so, so excited when we uh, launched our, our our beer, Pistol Pete's 1888. Um, you know, we were one of the fourth or fifth schools in the country to do that. Um, I got a couple of the samples uh, from the schools that had uh, went first, Louisiana Lafayette, Tulane, um, and uh, Montana. And then I started thinking, wow, I'm a, whenever somebody else would launch their beer, I would contact the AD or what have you. And, uh, you know, I think I'm only missing ah, about three or four right now. And, uh, but I've, I've gone some, to some great lengths. Southeast Louisiana doesn't make their beer anymore. So I even contact the brewer, the brewery in uh, Hammond, Louisiana. They only had one can left, and I wow. talked to one of their deputy ads, and he had two cans up in the in the attic, and he sent me one. So uh, I thought, yeah. So it's been a fun uh, it's been a fun pursuit to try to get every collegiate beer for my office. Yeah, that's, that's great. Well, so speaking of beer, Mario, I assume uh, is it safe? To, Katie and I enjoy beer on our on these episodes. Is it safe to assume you'll be uh, enjoying one later on today? I will, because uh, after this uh, uh, podcast, I'll be uh, getting on an airplane and going to Las Vegas uh, for Excellent. men's and women's uh, uh, Western Athletic Conference basketball tournament. So I, I'm assuming I may have one or two out there. Very nice. Very nice. And Katie, what are you enjoying today? Uh, so I'm drinking one from a local uh, Gainesville, Florida brewery that, of course, during the pandemic, we've been featuring a lot of um, first magnitude. This one's called I Believe in Mermaids, and it's a hazy IPA. Um, and pretty much as those that have listened know we drink a lot of IPA, so they kind of all taste the same at this point, but it's very good. <laughs> well, I'm drinking the exact same one, so enjoying that with you. <laughs> Um, Mario, uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, these officially licensed consumables that New Mexico State has been so active in, anywhere from beer to coffee to candles? Maybe tell us a little bit more about some of your goals in that area and how those products can help develop the, the New Mexico State brand. Sure. You know, it, it's um, there's a lot of facets that go into it. You know, we're aligned uh, with the collegiate licensing company out of Atlanta, Georgia. There are uh, licensees, so they um, they visited with us in, I think it was 2016, when I first, uh, you know, was relatively new in the job and they spoke to us about consumables. When I kind of asked them, what's that? And uh, they rattled off a bunch of different things and, and one of them was beer. And I said, wow, that's really interesting. And uh, I got all the necessary buy-offs on campus. And we were very fortunate that a couple of alums own this uh, emerging uh, brewery, Bosque <laughs> Brewing Company. Now they're the third largest brewer in the state of New Mexico. And they actually, we, you know, asked them what they thought. They said it was a great idea. And they actually had a golden ale that they were producing that they didn't have a name for. And um, that, that ended up many months later to become Pistol Pete's 1888 ale. And uh, it was exciting. You know, when we launched it, uh, we had every TV station from El Paso to, to come down. It was a big story because at the time it was about the fourth or fifth collegiately licensed beer. Um, what really made it take off because it first debuted in kegs you know they didn't have a cannery and things like that uh, but once they moved their operation where they could can the beer um that took off you know um a little bit more but then they aligned themselves with uh, a distributor admiral beverage who's the miller coors distributor in the state of new mexico so it has blossomed to in just a few local places that you know would tap a keg to 70 cities uh, in the state of New Mexico and over 300 locations. So, you know, the T-shirt that I'm wearing or the polo shirt, you know, a fan will buy that and they won't maybe buy another one for five years. But every single beer that's open, um, you know, is revenue to the department. But you touched upon, um, you know, the branding aspect. 
you know, the, 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 the package that it came in is very sharp. It's got the crimson and the white. It's got our fight song on it, which is unique. You know, 1888 came from the year that um, uh, the school came into existence. So uh, we try to tie a lot of things into it. And we made the can uh, very collegiate and it's been phenomenal. Um, the last fiscal year, uh, it brought in to the athletic department and licensing revenue, $30,000. Wow. So to put that in perspective at New Mexico State, that would be my third largest ticketed sport behind men's basketball and football. So, you know, it's nothing to sneeze at. It's certainly a fun project, uh, but believe it or not, you know, I'm, I, I work also to try to get this beer into Albertsons, you know, the local grocery stores, to Walgreens, you know, which is controlled out of Chicago, Illinois. So, you know, it's interesting where an AD is actually, you know, working – with some people, you know, where can I get my beer and where can I get it sold? Because it does positively impact uh, our bottom line, which ultimately goes to help our 16 sports and 400 student athletes. Well, that's great. And you've touched on a lot of things there that um, kind of lead into my next question. As an FBS independent, um, do you find that you have to be a lot more innovative in revenue generation than, uh, than maybe you would at other schools? A hundred percent. You know, I was the senior associate AD at Missouri before they invented the deputy AD title uh, for many years. You know, I've been at Southern Illinois as the athletic director, the University of New Mexico, Texas State when it was Southwest Texas. So I've been at all different kinds of, of institutions. And um, when you are at this level, you know, is it, a, it is incumbent to mine every uh, revenue uh, stream you can get because the dollars are not um, as free flowing as a power five or even a, you know, a very well known group of five members. So yeah, it, it's forced us to uh, be innovative, but it's also quite frankly, it's opened my eyes to a terrific revenue stream, you know, and we'll talk about the other products um, as we get into this discussion, but uh, I can very easily see just the consumable category being a six figure stream for us, which is tremendous because there's not a whole lot of six figure widgets left out there to you know to bring into the department no that's exciting and um you know thinking of that in the in sounds like you've got your pulse on the financial uh, information which you need to obviously as athletic director what's the most important financial information that you track regularly that you really feel like you have to have at your fingertips uh to make well-informed decisions sure well you know it all starts out i have a phenomenal cfo uh, Ed Pazaski, uh, he is he is great. You know, you don't want the AD unless he has a finance background and accountancy background, uh, fiddling too much with the numbers. He's, he does great. And our faculty athletic rep um, is the chair of the Department of uh, Accounting here at New Mexico State. So I have a lot of people to rely on. Uh, our state is very unique because we get a tremendous subsidy from the state of New Mexico itself. And this state, unlike where I was in Missouri or Illinois or Texas, I actually lobby with state reps and state senators and the governor's office to procure funding for our department. We also take a, a pretty big subsidy from the school itself, right? And then there's, you know, our annual giving, you know, that's close to a million dollars, the Aggie Athletic Club, um, and then, you know, ticket revenue, and then our multimedia rights partner. So there's really five, I'd say, big ticket items. That's the state, that's the school, student fees, um, um, Aggie Athletic Club, our annual giving, and our multimedia rights holders. So I think you have to keep a keen eye on all five of those fingers uh, to make sure the revenue is coming in. And then, yep. you know, what I left out, and I, I you know, is the reality is uh, game guarantees. You know, as uh, we have historically relied on those, which I don't like to do, but last year, you know, when our Florida game and our UCLA game was canceled, that was $2.75 million. Uh, that I couldn't make up. And when you're talking about a $20 million budget, that's a that's a pretty significant hit. Absolutely. Yeah, so, um, you know, we've talked about your consumables and uh, the beer. Talk about some of the other products that you've created since then. Sure. Well, before, uh, Katie, before I get off the beer, I got to say that, you know, uh, <laughs> Pistol Pete's 1888 Ale won a bronze medal at the Great American Beer Festival a couple of years ago. And, you know, I didn't really uh appreciate that yeah. you know that's the number one uh way to get your beer judged in the united states and 
in the golden ale category, there's 160 entrants. So that was a big feather in our cap. You've yeah. got to have a good drinkable product. You can't just slap, you know, a name on it and say, well, people will buy it. And I found it's interesting. You know, you have your hardcore um, craft brew people, uh, uh, Coors people, Miller people, Bud people. But, you know, when you're at a game, um, many of those uh, loyalties kind of go by the wayside and they say, hey, I want to drink a Pistol Pete or after a victory, et cetera. But, um, you know, after um, the beer took off so well, I immediately called our local winery in uh, Las Cruces in Deming, New Mexico. Um, it was called St. Clair's. Now it's D.H. Les Combs. And it's run by a Frenchman who actually um, grew grapes in like the Algeria region. So like a high desert. And that's why he moved out here. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, you've got to have a couple of years to grow the grapes. And I got a phone call right at the start of the pandemic, right in April. And they said, hey, we've got a Cabernet Sauvignon. Are you still interested? And I said, heck, yeah, I am. And that's how Pistol Pete's Crimson Legacy was born. And um, right off the bat, you know, we sold a ton of uh, bottles. Um, I think the packaging is great. You can kind of see it over my, what is it, my right shoulder. Yeah. Um, the nice thing on the back, instead of the fight song, we try to, you know, say, okay, it's wine. It's going to be a little classier. We told the story about how New Mexico was one of the first regions uh, to grow grapes in the, you know, the United States. It was really in the 1600s. They was, the, the priests were smuggling grapes up from Mexico and mm -hmm. growing along the Rio Grande Valley to use, you know, for their sacramental purposes. And then in the 20s, you know, the grape growers worked with our school, which back then was um, uh, New Mexico um, Agriculture and Mechanic Arts, um, to help increase the grape production. So it tells a nice little story, too. It was very well yeah. received. And then, of course, you know, the final frontier was spirits. Um, there was about 12 schools. And now there's about 25 schools or more that are doing a collegiate beer. There's about 12 um, that are doing a collegiate wine from Gonzaga to Michigan State to Wake Forest, uh, et cetera. But nobody had br broached the spirit industry. And we had a small business owner, Dry Point Distillers, uh, in Mesilla, which is an attached town uh, to Las Cruces. And uh, we, we, we talked about the idea for a while, and I got all the final approvals. And that's how Pistol Pete's uh, six shooter rye whiskey was born. And I tell you, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, the Whiskey Advocate did a really nice story on it, but um, we ran out of the first barrel immediately. Now he wow. distills his own product, but we didn't want to wait three years. Um, so we actually farmed it out um, to a, you know, a master distiller in Indiana. So that's where the rye whiskey comes. But um, right before Christmas, uh, people were panicking. I was getting text messages. We created a, a sign-up sheet on our website. We had 640 bottles spoken for while wow. they were waiting for it to come. And it, it has been a tremendous success. Um, uh, a lot of the you know bourbon whiskey aficionados uh, had said it tastes great, uh, but it has yielded uh, in the first quarter a $10,000 you know, royalty check to us. So it has wow. a chance maybe to eclipse the beer. I don't think it will because yeah. you know the sales slowed down a little oh. bit after the holidays. But uh, it's been phenomenal. And then through that, we launched a coffee, a mountain roast, and we got in the candle business, Pistol Pete's smell of victory. So uh, mm -hmm. we're going to keep the train going uh, because there's a lot of people who are interested in doing it. And um, the creation part, the graphics, the sign-offs, mm -hmm. the, um, the legalities of uh, the trademarks, once those are all crossed, you know, um, it's like after the baby's born, hey, just pass it around and everybody love on the baby a little bit. You know, we don't have to uh, do a whole lot more except, um, you know, help market it a little bit and, and watch the money come in. That's a great yeah, so start. For people that aren't in New Mexico, how can they get, how can they love on the baby and, and get some <laughs> of your products? Yeah, that's the trick, right? Because it's alcohol and not all alcohol can be sold across state lines, but um with wine you know it can now be sold in um you know you can order it online in over 40 states and we have this great graphic where we have you know crimson in all the states where you can order it you just click it and boom you know it'll show up on your door the coffee you can order in all 50 states uh, estasmanoscoffee.com and then the candle and once again all 50 states so you know would love for the for the liquor uh, the whiskey and the beer to be able to cross state lines but uh um you know that's not possible right now so i've heard a lot of stories 
about, hey, my buddy was in New Mexico and he picked it up and drove it to me in Colorado or Texas. So um, we've created a little bootlegging industry, I think, here at New Mexico State. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, well, shifting gears a little bit to the last 12 months um, and talking about COVID and especially with the restrictions for um, New Mexico, which have been more challenging than many states have had to face. Um, and you've developed a lot of creative ways to allow your athletes to continue with competition, um, particularly intrigued with the high school basketball facility that uh, you're using in El Paso, Texas. Um, but would you talk a little bit more about how you've managed the logistics around all of these alternate practice and game sites and what that's meant for you financially, too? Sure. I mean, obviously, it um, was was the biggest challenge of my career. Um, you know, there while there was a lot of COVID issues, a lot of pauses, things like that, um, there wasn't really a playbook to, to see how to move a team out of state. And um, uh, it was really started when the University of New Mexico decided to have their football season and they moved their entire football operation up to Las Vegas. So as basketball was getting closer, you know, the regents had voted 5-0 to let the chancellor kind of let us go out of state. It was not against the state's orders. I'm not saying they loved it, but it was certainly legal to do so. Um, so we moved our men's basketball team over to Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, the women could have done that as well, but they chose to kind of be road warriors and take their show on the road. They later moved to the same hotel, the Arizona Grand, and that's where we got practice. We started. Uh, but, you know, in truth, in looking back at this, um, the guys were so together. It was a public resort. It was not a bubble, uh, but we tried to bubble it as much as we can. But we got hit with a bunch of COVID pauses on the men's side, which we were really slow out of the gate. In January, uh, the governor's orders were amended that we could have full contact practice. Uh, before, um, it was only four individuals and one coach non-contact, which might be great for golf or tennis, but it, you know the other 60, the other 14 sports, um, you know, really couldn't couldn't get anything done. So we immediately moved everybody back in January, but the order still stood. We could not play games in Las Cruces, New Mexico, in Doniana County. We are very fortunate that El Paso, Texas is, you know, less than 20 miles away. So we're that close to the border of Texas. So we immediately contacted mm -hmm. all of our friends in the sports industry over there, the Sun Bowl, all the media members to try to get all these locations. Uh, the Don Haskins Center where UTEP is playing. Obviously, they've got UTEP men and women. So we worked with them. We had some basketball games there. But the majority of the games on the men's and women's side was played at Eastwood High School in El Paso, Texas. And it was a great small college gym. You know, they had they'd done some bonding. They had like a $30 million arena. It was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So it worked out great. But you know, when you have to move your shot clocks there, you know, it still was a high school infrastructure. So we had to do a lot of work to get that up to speed to nationally televise men's basketball games. You know, our games are on Fox Sports Arizona, which you can watch all over the country. So that took a lot. Um, we also are utilizing UTEP's soccer field. We're utilizing Memorial Gym for volleyball at UTEP, and that's where the 1966 Glory Road National Championship team, that's where their home is. Um, baseball, you know, we're about to do a contract with the AAA team of the San Diego Padres, the El Paso Chihuahuas. So uh, it has been um, really hectic just trying to move people back and forth while we're testing PCR three times a week, all of our student athletes, that's another mandate from the state that is well above um, the NCA minimum. So yeah, it has been a tremendous challenge, but every two weeks you get a report from the state and that's tomorrow. And I am very hopeful that our county turns yellow, which would allow us to actually compete in Las Cruces <laughs> for the first time all year. And you know, it's, it's, that's March 10th, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that I mean, it's amazing what you were able to accomplish, and it's a testament to a lot of the relationships that I'm sure you've built to be able to call and ask for help. And, um, you know, in talking about relationships, there's also been a lot of really great press about the New Mexico athletic directors all kind of getting together and meeting. And, um, you know, can you maybe talk a little bit about, you know, what, you know, what kind of 
meetings and goals that you come out of that and sure. how um, you can be rivals on the field but work together as a team off the field yeah yeah i'll talk about that you know i did uh, leave out a big part uh, from a financial standpoint you know how do you pay for this you know we were sensitive that even though we weren't breaking any rules we you know we're doing something that probably uh maybe some of the state officials w wished you know us and the lobos didn't you know wouldn't have done um, so we launched a, a, a campaign called Donate for State. So donate uh, the number four and state.com and we solicited donations. And it was interesting because we had about, we had collected about $225,000 in uh, men's basketball season ticket revenue and about 70,000 in football. So we, that was in our bank. So we went to those people and said, hey, here's your options. You can have a full refund. OK, you can keep that in our bank and use it for an Aggie purchase, you know, next year or you can, you know, donate it to the Aggie Athletic Club or you can give it all to the Donate for State, which helped all of our teams relocate. And boy, over 50 percent of the dollars or maybe it was 60 percent we kept. It was either donated or we kept in our bank. So it was tremendous. So, you know, that figure is almost at one hundred and seventy thousand dollars right now. Um, so that was a huge fundraising effort. So that I didn't want to leave that out. But you're right, it was interesting. Ryan Cordova, who's the athletic director and head men's basketball coach at New Mexico uh, College in um, Española, New Mexico, way up north, he started this Zoom meetings with myself, with Eddie Nunez, the AD at New Mexico, um, and the athletic directors from Eastern New Mexico, Western New Mexico, and New Mexico Highlands. And that was the, the, the bulk of our group also, um, um, the Southwest University in Hobbs, New Mexico. And we would get on and just talk about the challenges. Usually New Mexico or New Mexico State would be maybe the information distributor to those schools from the state of New Mexico because mm -hmm. we had a little bit more of a direct tie to them. But it was great to kind of collaborate, kind of be able to maybe co consolidate our message. Um, you know, all of our student athletes from all the schools, the SAT groups, all wrote a letter to the governor so you know it was it was a uh, it was nice because even in my five years i knew who some of those people were certainly you know i had known eddie uh, from his days at lsu but um we have not had this level of communication i mean i think it's pretty historic that every friday we would get on just to touch base about what was going on in the state and how we could help each other yeah that's great um on topic with 80s coming together, um, you're also one of the 60 plus Division One athletics directors who have signed the Collegiate Coaching Diversity Pledge. And our firm serves as the third party clearinghouse that confirms compliance. So the project's pretty near and dear to us for multiple reasons. Um, will you share with us uh, more on your commitment to diversity? And do you have any words of encouragement to maybe apply some peer pressure to some other ADs to opt into this pledge as well? Well, I would hope that, you know, peer pressure wouldn't be needed because I think it's the right thing to do. Whenever I've done a search, we have taken great pains to make sure that it has uh, diverse uh, candidates, um, whether it's gender, whether it's race, et cetera. You know, it was interesting, and I'll tell you a little funny story. When I first got the athletic director's job in 2006 at Southern Illinois, when I was coming from Missouri, I um, was at NACTA. Right. You know, a lot of people gather and kind of shoot the breeze and this, that and the other. And I, I was in a group over here and there was, oh, I don't know, probably about eight African-American uh, individuals and in their group. And Sean Frazier, who's the athletic director at Northern Illinois, he walks up to me and says, hey, congratulations on the job. He goes, now what nationality are you? And I said, well, you know, I'm Cuban, Jamaican, Italian. He goes, I got a perfect thing for you. You need to be involved in MOA, you know, the Minority Opportunities Athletic Association. And I got involved and then I got on the board and then I was the president of our of the largest um, uh, minority administrators group in the country. So that allowed me to, you know, interact to kind of, I hate to say, see the other side of things. But, you know, we were on the ground floor from an administrator standpoint of what the hot button topics are. Um, we worked with a lot of different uh, minority groups, the MIOC, et cetera. Um, and then I you know, was uh, Lee Reed is one of my best buddies because we went to grad school together. Uh, he's the president of the McClendon Foundation. So I'm now I'm on, I'm on the board of the McClendon Foundation. So, um, you know, I see firsthand 
from talking with, you know, Gene Smith at Ohio State and Dan Guerrero, you know, who was the AD at UCLA before he retired and Ward Manuel at Michigan and you name it, uh, Ray Anderson at Arizona State. So, you know, that topic comes up a lot. And I would certainly hope that everybody would take the pledge and everybody would take great pains um, to do the right thing and have an unbelievably diverse, um, um, you know, candidate pool when you have those openings. And we all understand, look, um, it's easier to attract people to Atlanta, Georgia than it is Las Cruces, New Mexico. But that doesn't mean that I shouldn't be doing everything I can to ensure that my pool is diverse, whether it's something really high profile like a head men's basketball coach or whether it's, you know, just a regular staff member. Uh, we work very closely with uh, Laura Castile here um, in the Office of Institutional Equity. And, um, you know, she's a partner with us on this. And, um, you know, she is always, you know, we, we keep her very abreast. So she is very aware of our desires to, um, uh, to have this diverse candidate pool for every position, not just the high profile ones. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's great. And Mario, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, I think it's been some really useful information. A lot of schools can learn from some of these outside of the box revenue generators. And especially now, um, you know, everyone's looking for any ways they can, you know, continue to bring in funds and support their student athletes. And, um, you know, I mean, even you said it's your your beer is your third largest um, ticketed sport. And I mean, that's that's huge. And that can really impact a lot of lives. And and it's it seems like it's really exciting and a new venture that uh, schools can get into. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Um, cheers and go Aggies. All and right. next time, next time, let's schedule this where it's a little later in my day so I can join you. you know, <laughs> I'm awesome. drinking coffee here. And you guys Absolutely. are drinking beer, so you know. Yes. Think think of me next time. A little later. Looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mario. Thanks, Thanks guys. Mario. Appreciate it. Thanks for having Bye. me. To learn more about the James Warren Company Collegiate Athletics and Higher Education segments, go to jmco.com. And don't forget to sign up for insights to get our latest industry updates, news, and events delivered straight to your inbox. You can also follow us on Twitter at JMCO Higher Ed and on LinkedIn for the latest news as the landscape of collegiate athletics and higher education is continually evolving.